I'm going to try, I think, and answer this question uh, that was posed by Mike to some extent of, is there a form of science cultural capital? Uh, to which the answer, the immediate and obvious answer in some senses is yes, there is an economic form of science cultural capital because that form of cultural capital in the form of qualifications enables you or gives you access to various professions which will advantage you economically. And in some senses, I think that's not contentious. That, to some extent, is what dominates very much the policy field uh, and uh, how people view science education uh, commonly. Uh, I want to try and stretch that notion a bit, for, a bit further than that and say that actually I think there's a kind of uh, 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 intellectual form of cultural capital which is important and to outline or sketch out what I think that is uh, and why it matters. And I think the first thing, point I want to make okay, is that clearly within society, knowledge matters. Those who have access to knowledge, in some senses, gain uh, or are given uh, positions okay, uh, uh, in society, and they can engage in discourses that others can't. And also, some of that knowledge, in some senses, is transformative. So my first argument, though, in fact, is that actually school science contributes little to what you might call this socially valued cultural capital. Yes, it contributes to the economic aspect, but what is this socially valued in, uh, aspect in that sense? Now, my sort of in, in proof of this, and my empirical of this, is imagine yourself at a social occasion, uh, and you ask somebody, try this out for yourself, what they valued about the school science they studied at school. Commonly, when I do this, there's a kind of lot of hesitation. There's a kind of desperate uh, rambling through their mind, uh, and some kind of little fact gets dredged up, or they tell you about some amazing demonstration that they actually saw and remember at school. But what's missing from that funda fundamentally, I think, is the sense of an idea. Because fundamentally, science is about ideas, ideas that have transformed the world, and the question you have to ask is, why is it that school science fails to communicate that? Fails to communicate, I think, too often, in too many cases, that sense of the world is not as you think it is, in that sense, that sense of awe, that sense of disruption, uh, and ch changing the way in which you actually see the world. And so, for instance, the idea, uh, in that sense, that most of the uh, uh, elements in our body, apart from the hydrogen and helium, were actually synthesized in some star uh, billions of years ago. The idea, for instance, that every cell in your body carries a chemically coded message about uh, how to replicate yourself. These, in some senses, are quite amazing ideas. And yes, they are sort of there in the school science curriculum, but the, uh, that emphasis is not there. So I think the first point, obviously, in fact, I'm trying to make is that knowledge matters. And clearly, in fact, that knowledge, as I said, gives you some kind of economic advantage. But that value, that value doesn't come from that kind of miscellaneous facts. Okay, the, that outcome, which you get when you talk to somebody socially, is simply a product of the fact that each stage of the school science curriculum bears a responsibility for preparation for the next. Science is a very strange subject on the curriculum because in some senses the justification for it is always in terms of what careers it opens up. People don't do, for instance, mathematics, they don't do history for that particular reason. So why is it that science in some senses is saddled with that particular uh, responsibility? And the product of that in some senses is that people never emerge with a coherent overview of what the intellectual achievements are of science and to some extent the forms of thought that permeate current contemporary society. Even those who continue in on into being a research scientist okay, never really achieve that kind of coherent overview. They have a good understanding of their own narrow domain but the broader picture is lacking in that sense. So I think what I want to argue is what is needed is an understanding of the kind of social capital that is associated with science, the ideas that have framed and shaped our thinking, okay, which should be an entitlement for all students. Because the economic value of science, the economic capital, is only of value to that relatively small minority who go on to pursue medicine, engineering, and sciences. And what we fail continually to think about is in some senses what is uh, that they all need. Those who do have that kind of understanding, I think, have their lives enriched by, 
uh, by that sense, because they start to understand the intellectual tradition that they're part of in that sense, even if it's only partially glimpsed. In that sense, in some senses, that's what a good literature education does. So what is it that particularly science has contributed to uh, contemporary thought? Uh, and I think here, what I draw on is the, the work of a historian of science, Alistair Crombie, who has a three-volume uh, hi cognitive history of science. And after 20 years of work, basically what he says is if you look at the uh, history of uh, science, there are really six dominant styles of reasoning. First of these is, okay, is mathematical deduction, which begins with the Greeks and is continued with the work of Leibniz, Newton, Newton Ryman and others. Mathematics okay, is very much firmly part of all of the sciences and of all of the discourses and attempts to simplify it or make it easier. In some senses, deny people an important form of uh, uh, intellectual engagement with life. Second of these is experimental exploration, which emerges in the 14th century but takes off with Galileo. Uh, and I think actually, which I'd argue now, is given too much emphasis in the current uh, curriculum uh, because people begin to think that actually all science is about is doing experiments. Okay, it's not. The experiments are in the service of developing the ideas. Third of these is hypothetical modeling, uh, which again begins with Galileo. Galileo is the kind of recurrent hero in this, okay? Okay, and then advances with the chemists and physicists of the 19th century, obviously people like Maxwell, Einstein, and others. But these are the people, in some senses, who have changed our thinking about the world. You get your name in lights in science because you develop a new theory, a new idea. Fourth of these is categorization and classification, which is absolutely essential to, to science because until we sort out what is out there, and we are still in the process of sorting out what is out there and define it, we cannot study it. The obvious example of this, to some extent, is what chemists did with the sorting out what are the elements. Because until they had done that, obviously, Mendeleev couldn't have done his work with the periodic table. Fifth mode of thought, in that sense, then, is uh, probabilistic and statistical thinking, uh, which is very much the basis of epidemiology uh, and much everyday thinking, particularly those of you who are like friends of mine who have been recently uh, engaged in gambling on the outcome of the World Cup from that point of view. Uh, but actually, the, the strange irony, in fact, is that that's virtually absent from the formal curriculum, both the science curriculum and it's not treated well in the mathematics curriculum, yet this is very much a kind of dominant mode of thought uh, in terms of the ways in which we engage in life. And the sixth one, which is obviously tremendously important, uh, uh, is evolutionary accounts of origins. That's origins of the universe, the solar system, uh, and of the species. Now, each of those styles of reasoning, in that sense, has to develop its own entities to reason with and its own particular procedures and epistemic values. So, for example, if you take the issue of plate tectonics, it brings into being concepts like seafloor spreading, magma, plates, subduction, in that particular kind of way. Geology, for instance, has to classify rocks because, obviously, until it's done that, it can't uh, begin in the process of uh, engaging and thinking about what's actually happening and it invents such processes as sedimentation, volcanic extrusion, things like that. Uh, in the case of physics, for instance, the physics is dependent, again, on categorization and classification, sorting out concepts such as what is the difference between heat and temperature, uh, which is, sounds like a very simple question, but actually a very complex question, and many physicists themselves still struggle with it. So those, I think, okay, is a kind of sketch of the forms of reasoning that matter that have contributed to Western scientific thought. There's nothing particularly necessary about their existence. They are culturally contingent products okay, in that kind of way. But what does this mean, I think? First, it means that if we have that kind of outline, we have a broader vision of the cultural capital that science offers. Okay, 40 years, I think, of working within science education has long since taught me, I think, that school science lacks that vision. And having that vision is something that we need to work for because that's really what ought to be the outcome, the kind of performance that's being talked about. What's notable, I think, for instance, about the Royal Society recent document on a vision for STEM education, which just been published, is this absence of any vision of what the cultural contribution of science is and why it matter, matters. It's got plenty of economic vision in it, 
in that sense. But that doesn't justify science for all. If science is valuable, it's valuable because it's transformative for the individual. And in what way is that possible? So I think, second, it means recognizing okay, that the construction of knowledge is a dialectic between construction and critique. And that the most valued form of cultural capital in contemporary society is the ability to engage in critique. Developing such capital is dependent on practice. And if it's dependent on practice, then students need opportunities to engage okay, in scientific critique. Why, then, is it so absent within school science? Why are there no questions which ask students to identify the flaws in the experimental design, the errors in the representation of a set of data, or the flaws in a specific model? Because that, I think, in some senses, is an important practice. Rather, what you get is that students are educated to believe that science provides unequivocal and unquestioned answers. First, that's wrong, okay? because there's a lot that we do in science okay, that we don't know the answers to. Okay? And second, it fails to offer students any chance to practice and to build the cultural capital that might help them in their daily lives. Because only by using that knowledge in critique do you start to understand its value. So that absence of critique fails, I think, to build in students the ability to question what you might call the dominant cultural arbitrary, which Bourdieu talks about, or to engage with scientific thought. Rather, they're forced into the position of taking it or leaving it. And many of them, I'm afraid, just choose to leave it because it's something that they didn't engage with and it didn't seem to have value to them originally. I think science capital struggles with other capitals simply because... The, the other forms of capital do recognize the importance and role and va value of critique. Okay, what is the study of literature if it is not the study of literary criticism? Okay, moreover, if we think of cultural capital as something which is enabling, we need to ask what kinds of performances students who had that valued cultural capital would be capable of undertaking, other than just reproducing this miscellany of facts. At least, I think, we should be able to expect them to read a media report of science and ask several questions whose answers might help them to better understand the significance of the report. Doing so would require them to, to know, I think, which style of reasoning the work is situated in and the premises in which it's actually based and the procedural and epistemic uh, values, that, the, uh, procedural, procedural practices and epistemic values that underlie it. Now, individuals who have such cultural capital in science are not experts. Okay? We're not in the business, obviously, of creating experts. What we're trying, I think, to do is to give them the cultural capital, the wherewith, all in that sense, to intellectually engage and to ask questions and to reduce the epistemic dependence on the expert. We are, to some extent, all dependent on expertise, but we need to be able to question expertise in a meaningful way. Now, I think my problem with what we are doing with much science education at the moment is that we are totally dominated, in some senses, by the economic imperative. And as long as we do that, we will fail to think about what it is that actually matters, why science, in some senses, occupies the position that it does in society. And to some extent, I think Mike raised an interesting point here that many of the, what you might call the contemporary intellectuals, at least within British society, I was amusing to myself whether this was true of American society, uh, had come from a, a scientific background uh, in, in that sense. But what is it that they are offering, and why is it that school science, to some extent, is not doing the same kind of thing? Because what school science needs to be do, offering its students as a product okay, and an enabling practice is something which needs to be uh, transformative. So to conclude, in trying to sketch out, I think, Okay, what matters in science, the kinds of cultural capital which I think are undervalued but which are significant, I think we have to start from the basic premise that science is a set of ideas. Okay? And we have to be able to present to students a coherent view of what that set of ideas are. I've sketched out one of them, but I think that's just simply up to, for debate. Elites in society have access to that particular form of cultural capital. They are able to use that knowledge to engage in the discourse with people who are policy makers, who are scientists, who are in, uh, influential. And I think it's important that we try and help as many students as possible to do and engage in that kind of discourse on, in their own kinds of uh, terms as well.
So I think my kind of concluding question then in some sense is, is what kind of cap capital would be transformative for individuals? And if we can better define that, in some senses, I think we have a better sense of what the goal and the outcomes of formal education might be. In particular, it's that question, I think, that Seamus asks about practice. What kinds of things would people be able to do if they had a valued form of cultural capital as a consequence of their formal science education? Thank you.